this lecture, we'll continue our investigation of classical genetics by looking a little bit beyond Mendel. So we'll be looking at Mendelian inheritance patterns that don't quite exhibit the expected ratios. This isn't that Mendel was wrong, they're just extensions of his concepts. So by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to predict the outcomes of mono and dihybrid crosses using probability methods, as well as interpret test cross data to determine unknown phenotypes. And finally, you'll be able to explain why not all crosses exhibit Mendel's predicted phenotypic outcomes. So first, let's begin by looking at probabilities. We can predict the outcome of test crosses using a much simpler method, really, than Punnett squares. Some of us get hooked on Punnett squares, but realistically, probability methods are a much more simple way to go about it. I don't know how much experience you've had with probability, but we'll take a quick look at two rules. One is the rule of addition, and one is the rule of multiplication. And these are rules that really allow us to turn sentences into mathematical equations. The rule of addition states that two mutually exclusive events, the probability of either event occurring is the sum of their two probabilities. Now, that seems like a lot of words, so let's look at an example so that you can see what we mean exactly. Let's say you have one six-sided dice, and you want to roll that dice and get either a one or a two or a three or a five or a six. Well, you probably already have a pretty good idea that no matter what six-sided dice you roll with six numbers on them, you are very likely to get one of those numbers, as in 100% of the time, unless it balances on a corner or something strange, you will get either one of these six numbers. So let's take a look at that mathematically. There's a probability of one six that we could get a number one, or there's a probability that we could get a number two, one out of six, or we could get a 3, or a 4, or a 5, or a 6. When we sum these probabilities, indeed, we do find that the math verifies that we have a 100% probability of rolling one of the six sides of the dice. So the addition rule means or. So anytime you see or, or can stuff an or into a sentence, it means you're going to add the probabilities of the independent events. So now let's look at the rule of multiplication. This is an and rule. So anytime you can stuff an and in, we will multiply. It states that the probability of two independent events both occurring is the product of their individual probabilities. So let's take a look at that on our dice so that we can put some meaning behind all those crazy words. Let's say we have two dice this time and you want to roll a one and a six. So there is a one sixth probability of rolling one and on the second dice and you want to roll a six. So we have one sixth times one sixth, and that gives us a one thirty sixth chance of doing it exactly this way. We can have a one and then a six, right? So, and really means to multiply. Anytime you can jam and into a sentence, when we're thinking about probability, you're going to multiply the two probabilities. Anytime you can put an or in, you will add them. You don't really need to know the specific language of the probability law, just the and and or part. So let's use these probabilities to now try and predict outcomes of perhaps a monohybrid cross to see how it applies to genetics. Trust me, it's really much more simple than you think. The probability of having a homozygous recessive outcome from a heterozygous self-cross, we know by looking at our favorite Punnett square that it is a one-fourth probability. So homozygous recessive, the white flower is a one-fourth probability. Let's look at it mathematically. If we look at the male parent up on the top, we see that he could contribute a big P or a little P. So the pollen could be big P or little P. 
And then if we look at the female parent, it could also contribute a big P or a little p. So each of those have a one-half probability. You're either going to get big P or you're going to get little p. So we can say what we need in order to get the white plant, white flower, is a little p from the parent and a little p from the other parent. So we need to have two little p's, in which case we have an and problem. Most genetics problems will truly use the and um, rule. So here we have a one-fourth chance. Mathematically, we've shown that we do indeed have a one-fourth chance of getting the homozygous recessive white flower. So hopefully you're beginning to trust that these methods of calculating probabilities are slightly easier than or at least faster than drawing a Punnett square. You can play with this using coins and saying I have 10 coins and I have a 50% chance of heads or tails, and if I have 10 coins, you know, you can throw them thousands of times. But you could trust, based on their knowledge of Punnett squares, that they do work out. So now, let's look at the probability in the same cross of getting a heterozygote. In this case, purple, but heterozygously purple. There are two ways to get that heterozygote purple. One is by the male parent contributing a little p and the female parent contributing a big p. The other is by the female parent contributing a little p and the male parent contributing a big p. So we know from our knowledge of Punnett squares and our knowledge of these heterozygote crosses, we already know there is a 50% probability and there's a one quarter prob probability of each different way. So we can add those two probabilities together in order to find out that yes, indeed, 50% or one half of the progeny from this cross will end up being heterozygous. But there are two different ways to become heterozygous. So you could become heterozygous by this way or this way. So hopefully we can trust these rules of probability and you can transition into using them to calculate the outcomes of crosses. An example of where you might need this is perhaps if you were doing a tri-hybrid or tetra-hybrid cross. Could you imagine making the Punnett square for that? You'd be working for hours trying to keep track of all the different gametes and finally have an outcome and try to keep track of all of the different genotypes. Trust me, the probability method is much simpler. So let's use it to take care of a dihybrid cross with probabilities. We've already explored monohybrid, but we can make a dihybrid cross much more simple. Let's say we split the two traits. So we're looking at round versus wrinkled, the R allele, or we're looking at yellow versus green, the yellow allele. Let's ask the question, what is the probability of getting the homozygous recessive in both cases? Now, if you recall a dihybrid cross, you probably have in the back of your mind that it was that very bottom corner and there were 16 squares, so 1 16th probability. But let's prove it with mathematics. If we split the two alleles and show just the round wrinkled locus in one monohybrid and just the uh, yellow, I mean green, in the other monohybrid, and we combine those probabilities, what is it? Is it and or or? We're looking for wrinkled and green. So we multiply those probabilities. We know because we already know about monohybrid crosses with heterozygotes that we would have this possibility of one-fourth. We've got a good visual of that. So we do the mathematics behind it. One-fourth times one-fourth indeed does equal one-sixteenth. Are your trust levels going up for probability? Because it's a really cool technique. So now I have a question. We're moving on to a different topic. But if you have a purple flower and you're just looking at it, how do you know if it is heterozygous or homozygous? Now, there's a great way to test it out. It's called a test cross. 
So we're asking a question with a test cross. We're testing for the answer. We have our purple flower. We know it could be big P, big P, or it could be big P, little p. But before we cross it and get a whole load of progeny and count all the numbers, we probably should know that it's true breeding or not true breeding. So how do we tell? So we're going to ask the, ask the question, is this a big P, big P plant? In order to find out, we can cross it with a homozygous recessive white flowered plant and look at what the offspring are. Take a moment to think if you crossed with a homozygous white plant, you could only get the recessive allele, right? And if you paired that with a homozygous dominant plant, what might the outcomes be? So let's take a look. Here you can see with just a recessive allele and a dominant set of alleles, you would only have purple progeny. But what if we had a big P and a little p, a heterozygous parent flower? So if we have the heterozygous parent flower, then we could have a big P or a little p crossed with only a little p because we test cross with a white homozygous recessive flower we'll look at the results, you'll notice that we end up with 50-50. So 50% 50 of the offspring would be purple and 50% would be white. Again, that is because the white allele has maintained its integrity and is going to show up in the offspring. So again, a test cross allows us to test for heterozygosity or homozygosity in a dominant phenotype organism or plant here, in this case, the purple flowers. So Mendel started his assumptions with some specific rules. You'll recall that he looked at some very distinct traits that exhibited certain outcomes. And he did this on purpose so that he could find some general rule for how inheritance patterns happened. Now, lots of things exhibit Mendelian inheritance patterns, but don't necessarily have the same sorts of phenotypes. So Mendel had determined that each trait was specified by a single gene, whether it was flower color or seed shape or whatever. He, by chance perhaps, but picked that one single gene um, would specify that trait. And that there were only two alternatives. He only saw round or wrinkled. He only saw tall or short. And the gene products acted independently of each other. So there was no dependence of one gene, like in a metabolic pathway, you could imagine if you have enzyme A and it's broken, you don't get the product B and thus you wouldn't get C. So no in independence of the genes. And then also he didn't choose any genes that had environmental effects or he didn't choose traits because he didn't know about genes. So let's look at some examples where Mendelian inheritance is happening, but not getting the expected phenotypes. So Skin color is a great example of a continuously varying trait. So is height. Right? There isn't black or white. There isn't tall or short. There are many different varieties on a continuum. Generally, when we see these sorts of things, it involves multiple genes. Here's a very simplistic example of how that might work out. Let's say there were three genes for skin color. Skin color comes about by the production of pigment, and there are three genes involved in the production of that pigment. So if we were to use a Punnett square to predict the outcomes of this, it would be quite complicated. But you can see that there is a spectrum, a continuous spectrum of color that could be obtained dependent on how many alleles are displayed for pigment. This is a really simplified view of how it works, but it does demonstrate the idea of multiple genes or having a continual, continuous effect polygenic inheritance is meaning that we have multiple genes involved in the expression of this trait. Height is another, another example, and we can see here that height in general will form a continuous or bell-shaped curve with less very small people, lots of medium people, and less very tall people. So it's on a continuum. Anytime you see a continuum, we generally are talking about polygenic 
inheritance or multiple genes being involved. So as we move on, we can see that other genes have more than one effect. For example, we have a single gene and it ends up in the production of one phenotype, A or B or C. Examples of this can be found in all sorts of different situations, but let's look at one where one phenotype might actually be a lethal phenotype. Here we're looking at agouti mice, and in the, this case we have an allele for yellow. The capital Y is dominant for yellow color. But it is lethal when there are two copies for some reason. So in this case, when we cross two heterozygotes, we end up with one recessive trait, which would be the brown or a gooty mouse, and the two yellows because the Y allele is dominant. But in the bottom corner, we see two dominant Y alleles that are lethal, and if the mouse has two copies of it, then it doesn't make it to live. And so the ratio here is skewed. We have a one to two ratio in the offspring. Consider again that we have a number of offspring, not just four, but we're counting probably in the tens and hundreds to see these ratios. Another example where Mendel's ratios didn't play out and we may have this pleiotropic inheritance is in albinism and sickle cell anemia. In albinism, someone is lacking the pigment to uh, produce or lacking the enzyme to produce pigment, and that has multiple different effects. Not only do they not have pigment in their hair, but also in eyelashes and in skin, and a number of different other phenotypes are associated with one gene mutation. Sickle cell anemia is a great example of pleiotropic inheritance. It results from our hemoglobin molecule having a mutation in the beta subunits. And so when it stacks up inside the red blood cell, not only does it not carry oxygen, but it causes a sickling of a cell, which is a secondary effect. And that sickled cell will tend to get stuck in some of the smaller blood vessels. So there are a number of circulatory phenotypes associated with just one mutation. Later, we'll get to understand that it is just one tiny base change in the DNA that ends up causing these multiple uh, or pleiotropic effects. In another situation, we could have multiple alleles involved. Recall Mendel chose things that had duality, just two different alleles. Now, in the type of, um, and in blood typing, A, B, and O blood typing, we have three potential alleles. And as you can see from the table here, there are a number of different outcomes. Each individual may only have two, but in the population, there are three. And so some people are blood type A, and some people are blood type AB, and some people are B and some people are O, all dependent on which two alleles they get. So this is an example of multiple alleles. Now, blood typing is interesting because it also exhibits codominance. That brings us into our next variation from phenotypic ratios that we might expect in Mendelian inheritance. With blood type A, an individual's red blood cells contain the A antigen or the A name tag. And that A name tag makes it specific to A individuals because the immune system is not going to attack it. Now, a type B blood cell has type B antigens and a type AB blood type displays both antigens and O means simply no antigens on the surface. The AB individual in ABO blood typing scheme has Codominance. This means that both phenotypes are being displayed. This is not an intermediate. For example, it's not pink, right? It's distinctly different. An individual with type A blood cannot take type AB blood, nor can an individual with B take AB because it is a distinct phenotype. So it is not blending inheritance. 
we'll look now at something that looks slightly like blending, but is also not blending inheritance. Recall blending was the inheritance pattern that people were subscribing to mostly before Mendel's time. Let's look at incomplete dominance, in which we do get an intermediate phenotype. We will cross a red flower, and the color allele in this type of flower, these are not pea plants, is R for red or W for white, in which case no pigment is produced. The offspring of this cross will end up producing a pink flower. Why does it end up producing a pink flower? Well, that's because we have one R, and so one enzyme is making red color, while the other enzyme on the other chromosome is not making red color, and so we get an intermediate. So in this case, we have incomplete dominance because the R allele is not completely dominant, as in covering up the white allele. And when we cross that F1 generation to produce an F2 generation in incomplete dominance, we see a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic as well as phenotypic ratio. So I have to ask you a question. Why is this not blending? It sure looks like blending, doesn't it? Why is it not blending? Well, imagine that in this case, we have the red and the white flower, and as I explained, we have one allele that makes red and one allele that makes white. It looks like blending because they become pink. But when we do the F2 cross, we see the reemergence of white, which is why all of these questions started anyway. Why is it that the offspring of the F2 generation might look something like one of the grandparents. So incomplete dominance is not blending, and nor is co-dominance that we saw in blood cells. So definitely we're seeing an exhi exhibition of Mendelian inheritance patterns. However, the phenotypes display themselves slightly differently. We end up with different ratios than we might expect from the simple Mendelian pattern. Another example is that environment could affect the expression of genes. Here, we are going to look at uh, Himalayan rabbits or... Um, Siamese cats, and they have a specific fur that is temperature dependent. So when the temperature is below 33 degrees C, we have an active form of tyrosine, and that active form of tyrosine ends up being allowing the cat to produce color in that fur, or allowing the fur to produce color. So we see that extremities, the tips of the ears, tips of the nose, tips of the feet, and tail, end up having darker color than the body because at body temperature, or 33, above 33 degrees C, we see that tyrosine is inactive and has no pigment production. So that accounts for the lighter fur. You'll notice that when you put a Siamese cat outside, it's more of an outdoor cat than an indoor cat. They'll end up with much darker body fur because they are experiencing cooler temperatures in general. Of course, I suppose you'd have to live in a colder environment. Um, when they're indoor cats, they tend to be lighter. And this blackening tends to also help them stay warmer because the darker color absorbs more heat. So it's an adaptation to particularly cold environments. So now let's think about metabolic pathways. So many things are created in a pathway. We've addressed some metabolism previously and known that one enzyme changes the substrate into a product and so on and so forth. And there are enzymes in line, for example, in cellular respiration. So there isn't really any independence between those enzymes. Something at the end of the pathway is completely dependent on earlier enzymes in the pathway. So let's look at this example. If we have a precursor molecule that does not produce any color and that molecule is converted by enzyme A into another molecule that also does not have any color, but it's necessary to have that in order to have enzyme B turn on the pigment or purple color. 
This pattern, this metabolic pathway exists in corn plants where we can take this individual plant that is homozygous for dominant and recessive genes combined. So we have the A enzyme in the homozygous dominant form, the B enzyme in homozygous recessive, and the opposite in the other parent. And we cross them, we end up having a purple offspring or purple population of offspring because they have both dominant A and dominant B. And you need the dominant B in order to get the purple color and move on through the pathway. So in the offspring, we'll see some skewed ratios. Remember that we would naturally expect a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, but because there is an interplay between gene A and gene B, we see a skewed ratio. This skewing of ratios is called epistasis. Another great example of epistasis, or one gene affecting the expression of another, is seen in Labrador retrievers. Here we have two heterozygously black labs crossed with each other, but the gene E actually codes for an enzyme that lets color be expressed or not expressed. When we cross these two Labradors together, we see that there are some skewed results, and that is because of the interplay of these genes. When we don't see a big E, as in the bottom corner, you end up with yellow labs. But anytime you see big E's, we're allowed to make color, and so now we can actually interpret the big B, little b alleles. Big B is the dominant allele, and if that allele is present, we end up with black labs. In order to get a brown lab, you have to have the homozygous recessive form, little b, little b. So as we look at the results, you'll notice anytime there's a big B, and a big E, we end up with a black lab, but in order to get a brown lab, you have to have a little b, little b, as well as a big E to permit production of that color, and any lab that does not have a big E is not able to produce the specified genotype as a phenotype because it cannot make that pigment. So again, a great example of epistasis, which involves the interaction of genes in metabolic pathways. So in this lecture, we've explored a lot of variations on Mendel's outcomes, predicted outcomes, although each of them still exhibit Mendelian inheritance. So by now, you should be able to predict the outcome of crosses using the methods of probability. In addition, you'll be able to interpret crosses, uh, test crosses to determine an unknown genotype and explain why not all crosses fit Mendel's predicted phenotypic outcomes. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to seeing you in the next lectures on genetics.